the brave, bold, heroic sack boy. A struggle for freedom, the likes of which our world has never seen. Carl Cavers, co-founder and CEO of Sumo Group, um, presenting with me today, I have David Wilton, our CFO. Um, so thanks for joining us for what is now our fourth full year results presentation. Before I go on in any sort of detail, I'd just like to, to give you a bit of background to Sumo for anybody that's new to, uh, to the business. Um, we're at over 1,000 people, and we now have 13 studios across five different countries. We provide premium video game development services, particularly full turnkey development, where we're responsible for delivering everything from the original game idea, executing full game development lifecycle, and essentially handing our partner with a finished game for, for them to publish and sell. Game development life cycles uh, are getting longer uh, and the teams that are required to deliver the scope of the games are getting bigger. It's not unusual for, for games to be in development now for five or six years and for the team sizes to be over 200 people. We also provide games as a service provision and, and this is activities after the release of the game. And games as a service can extend over multiple years during the life of the game it is, is being commercialized. There are various monetization opportunities for game sales and subsequent, the subsequent content uh, for release after the game's been uh, released. We've got an enviable long-term development fee visibility. Um, I'll come on to that in a, late, a slide later in the presentation, but it is a key strength of, of Sumo's operating model, which is low risk in itself. Our game development studios deliver game milestones every four to six weeks where we get paid and recognize our margin as we go through the game development life cycle. Uh, so that by the time the game is finished, um, it's very unlikely that there's any client disagreement as we've been delivering milestones which have been signed off and constantly approved. And we've made our gross margin and, and cash and therefore we're not participating in the commercial risk, although we do have some opportunities to receive royalty income on, on many of our projects going forward. We've also recently announced Secret Mode, a new division within Sumo um, to, to head up our publishing efforts. We now have several of our own IP titles that we can self-publish, Dear Esther, Snake Pass, uh, World Snooker, Prominence Poker, and Pass the Punch. And we also have opportunities to, to continue with Spider and Little Orpheus once their exclusivity period with Apple comes to an end. We'll continue to manage our uh, risk profile regarding investment in games through secret mode. Uh, and we believe offer a good, which we believe offers a good publishing opportunity. And very importantly, titles developed by one of our own studios can also be published by secret mode and this is a great creative outlet for our team just by way of introduction what has probably been the strangest year of everyone's life we're very pleased to be able to deliver what is a very strong set of results we've shown substantial growth in all areas of our business our people where our headcount growth and onboarding it has been exceptional, especially during a pandemic with overall headcount growth at roughly 36%, including acquisitions. We've had many game releases and game announcements. 
We've completed two acquisitions during the year with Lab 42 and Pipeworks, and more recently adding Pixelant over in Poland. As I've just mentioned, we launched Secret Mode, our new publishing division, and we've got very enviable long-term contracted revenue visibility, all against a market backdrop which never fails to excite us at Sumo. So moving on to, to Sumo since our IPO, and, and some of you may be new to the story, but some of you may have followed us over the last few years. And though we'd normally like to focus on, on, on looking forward, we wanted to take this opportunity to, to look back at how far we've come. Um, and 2020 has been a great year, which, which I think has cemented some real progress uh, from when we launched on market in December 2017. So we've increased the number of studios we have from five to 13. When we came to market, we, we had five studios in three countries. We've now got 13 studios in five countries. We've more than doubled our headcount in that time. At the same time, we've also more than doubled our revenue and also almost doubled our EBITDA. Our market cap's gone from an original 145 million to, to approximately 600 million that it is today. Lab 42, an acquisition that we completed during the year, which before we started, we, we wondered whether we could get any acquisitions done during a pandemic, but very glad to report that we did. Lab 42 has been fully integrated for some time within our business and is performing very well. Pipeworks, the acquisition we completed in October of a large US operation, which is, which is now a standalone operating division. Within Sumo Group, the integration is going very well. We've got some great collaboration already where Pipeworks are collaborating with, with other divisions within Sumo, including Secret Mode and Sumo. And as I've just mentioned, very recently we acquired Pixelant, a great start to establishing our team in Europe. They've hit the ground running and are ramping very quickly from what is a very exciting talent pool in Poland. So looking at, at, at the year in launches and game announcements, it's been an extremely busy 2020 um, with regard to game announcements and game launches. We've had 12 either announced or launched in the period. Uh, we're now working on more than 40 projects with 28 different clients, uh, only eight of which are announced. And it is always a challenge in terms of confidentiality and what I can share with regard to individual projects. But what I'm pleased to report is the 40 projects with 28 clients is up significantly from where we were 12 months ago, where we were working on 21 projects with 12 different clients. Notable game announcements are, first of all, HUD, which we remain very excited about. It was, it was a game that was originally announced in the summer of last year. It's due for release in May this year, and is getting some great previews and very excited audience. It's had over three and a half million views on YouTube since it was announced. And Sackboy, a big adventure, a game which we released for Sony um, back in November last year, which was a day and date release with the PlayStation 5 and which was very recently recognized with two BAFTA awards. And finally, Rival Peak, which is a game that was released by Pipeworks for Facebook. Very impressive stats. It's had over 100 million minutes watched, 200 million user engagements, and over 9.8 million views per episode as it ran for the 13 weeks that, that it ran from just before Christmas. Moving on to a little bit about our awards during the year. I won't dwell on everything here, but as I just mentioned, Sackboy, a big adventure, a game which we conceived and delivered for Sony, won two BAFTA awards after receiving four nominations. It won Best Family Game and Best British Game. Uh, so really pleasing to, to see that. In addition, our people rewarded us with the recognition of a three-star rating by Best Companies. This is an independent survey which our people take part in every year. We had an 88% engagement. And having previously received a one-star rating, which in itself is very good, we jumped to a three-star rating, which is the maximum rating you can achieve. Um, you know, a result of, of doubling down on, on people's experience and listening to previous results of the surveys. And in a business where talent is, is everything, we're particularly pleased to have received that recognition. 
So moving on to, to Sumo Digital's long-term contracted revenue position, you'll see on this slide that the long-term contracted revenue position is very strong. We already have contracted or near contracted 85% of the revenue for this year. And, and by near contracted, we mean uh, games or projects which are uh, in contract. We're just choosing not to sign at this point in time because we're, we're negotiating the final T's and C's, but the main commercial terms have been agreed. We've also got 60% of our revenue secured for 2022 and already 35% secured for 23 which is a huge amount of forward visibility. Sumo were extremely busy with contract execution last year. They signed 49 development agreements in the year, of which 34 were in the second half of the year. So a great position to be in and, and one which we value very highly. To give you an idea of like for like, the previous year in April 20, we were at 73% contracted for 21, so a great position to be in. And moving on to slide eight, we've broken out Pipeworks separately as they're running as a separate operating division. You can see that their long-term contracted revenue is also very impressive at 50% for this year, 24% for 22 and 11% for 23. They do work on slightly shorter term contracts in the main, which explains the difference of the lower term contracted percentage but it is also uh, very similar to levels seen in the previous year for Pipeworks. So again, a very encouraging position and start to the year. Overall, our, our contract of revenue is supported by our business development pipeline, which again has, has seen a huge amount of, uh, of, of growth over the last few years. Our pipeline currently stands at 429 million pounds of which we've got a factored value of 133 million. And by factored, we mean opportunities which we believe are more immediately addressable. But as you can see, with so much of our time already contracted, you know, one of the things we're struggling to do is to say yes to a lot of that work. So just a brief couple of slides on the COVID update, and hopefully this is the last time we have to report on COVID in the situation. But we believe we've managed the duration of the pandemic very well. You know, suddenly to, to move to remote working approximately 13 months ago, you know, it was quite a big task, but all of our teams and our support services within the business were up to that. We've worked from home very effectively, uh, very pleased to, to provide that, that we've, uh, we've maintained, you know, a, a, a culture of caring and support for everybody within Sumo Group. I think that's borne out by the, the recognition within the best companies survey. And, and we continue to, to operate very successfully whilst working from home. We've not seen uh, problems with productivity. In, in fact, contrary to that, we, we've seen some improvements in productivity in places. Our business development, as I've just mentioned, is, is uh, an all time high. And as we do look to return to the office, we believe that there's the potential of a an optimized hybrid solution between working from home and working from the office going forward. So just moving on to a little bit of an example around productivity. We've been cheering over the last three sets of results now that, that we've given out just where we were tracking. And productivity has remained pretty much on par with being in the office. If, if anything, underlying has slightly improved. And, and you know, people certainly aren't missing the commute to the office although we do find it, it more challenging to finish projects. So finishing Sackboy for Sony during the summer last year was, was more challenging working from home where you've got a team of, of over 200 people all trying to final a project where efficiency of communication is everything. And being in the office would have certainly been a, a nicer environment to complete that project, but needless to say that the game was finished on time and, and uh, delivered on time. During the year, we, we delivered 279 milestones. I talked about us delivering milestones every four to six weeks. We continue to do that very successfully. And, and you know, just, just really what remains to be said is we've continued to operate extremely effectively whilst working from home. And despite the impact of COVID in the working environment whilst being based from home with home school support and, and caring support, we've provided flexibility to all of our people 
so that they can continue to be effective when they do work. So with that, I'm going to hand you over to David for some financial highlights before rejoining you for the last part of the presentation. Thank, thank you, Carl. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk through the, the numbers. Uh, I've got eight slides to, to talk through the financial performance in, in calendar 2020. Uh, the, the, the summary I'd start with, uh, it was a very good year for us. We're very pleased with the results. Um, Sumo's best ever year and uh, so far and um, very, very positive outcome. So some of the metrics on this slide, I'll go into more detail in the subsequent uh, slides. So revenue, gross profit, gross margin, EBITDA and cash, I'll cover in more detail as we go forward. Utilization, we, we always quote our utilization figure for the group, it was 92.6% in 2020. What's interesting, if you look through that, the percentage in the UK was just under 96%. And the percentage in India was in line with historical norms at just under 80%, uh, very much as we expected it to be. Uh, development fee visibility, Carl's talked about, very strong going forward. Sumo Digital, 85% of forecast development fees and Pipeworks, 50%. If I go on to talk about revenue, so revenue for the year, just under £69 million sterling. That includes just over six million pounds sterling from Pipeworks, which we acquired. Uh, we completed the acquisition on the 16th of October. So we've got 10 weeks of Pipeworks results in there. The organic growth, if you take out Pipeworks and Lab 42, which we acquired in the year, was 24%. So, so very strong organic growth in the business. Uh, and bearing in mind that we were coping with the challenges of the pandemic around recruitment, we think that was a very strong performance. The balance between client IP and own IP revenues in line with the, the first half for the for the full year. So 18% own IP, 82% uh, client IP. Those percentages are markedly different from the prior year. And if you think about 2019, we were earning significant development fees on own IP that was being paid for by publishers. Um, and you can see that percentage there. We do not have a set percentage target uh, in mind for the, for the mix between own IP and client IP. Uh, bearing in mind the scarcity of our, of our capacity and resource relative to the demand for our services, uh, it is all about taking on the right project. Uh, and we are very happy to consider client IP projects or, or own IP projects when, we, when we're looking at how we allocate our resource. We would like over time to do more own IP, um, but, but that, that is over a long period of time. Uh, and our expectation is that client IP is likely to be at least half of the business for the foreseeable future. The other point I'd pick out on this slide is royalty income. Um, it's, it's, it's a more significant figure than it's been in the past. And notably, there's now 1.9 million of royalties on our own IP. So that's royalty we've, we've generated on games uh, where a publisher has paid for, for the development of that game. Uh, it's a good figure. It's interesting that, that there is a, a, a development and evolution of our business model in that the 1.9 million uh, of own IP royalty does not all flow through to the bottom line. So it's not pure profit. There are costs that are allocated against that revenue stream. If I go across the statutory and adjusted gross margin, this, this slide takes a little bit of explaining. So um, we've always looked very carefully at our gross margin. The backdrop is positive. We've always had strong demand for our services and we've never had a problematic contract. So there is no pricing pressure in our industry. And similarly, we've not got any contracts that are causing us any, any difficulties. In terms of the metric, statutory gross margin, is 45.7% for the year compared to 48.9% for the previous year. Now we flagged a couple of points at the, the half year uh, in relation to uh, stopping work on Snake Pass 2. Uh, we simply didn't have enough resources going forward to, to, to work on all the games we wanted to work on. And we took the decision that we would stop working on Snake Pass 2 and would expense the costs that we'd hitherto incurred on that game. That was in the first half, but clearly that effect carries through into the full year. We also had the holiday accrual, uh, which you would expect people business, uh, people didn't take holidays in the first half. We encouraged them to do so in the second half. 
and we made real progress with that. The balance on taking a holiday was down to about three days per person at the end of the year, which is still more than the, the normal, which is one one day, uh, but but down from where we were at the half year. And that has an impact on margin as well. We then look at Pipeworks. Um, we acquired Pipeworks in, uh, as I say, mid-October. Pipeworks has a different business dynamic to Sumo Digital, uh, and it's interesting. Their gross margin is notably lower than the gross margin in Sumo Digital, but their gross profit per head is higher. So they are paying more in terms of employment costs, but but generating more in terms of revenue. And the, the difference is in the region of 10 percentage points. The other variable between the two businesses is that um, Sumo Digital benefits from the video games tax relief, and there is no equivalent in the state of Oregon uh, where Pipeworks is, is located. So um, what we've done is in our management KPI, we've adjusted revenue for VGTR. And the logic for that is that we treat VGTR as a proxy for revenue. So when we're agreeing contract terms with a publisher at the outset, if the publisher wants to keep the VGTR directly, we will charge a higher revenue figure compared to where the publisher wants us to keep the VGTR and therefore we would charge a lower revenue figure. So the logic would be that you would combine revenue and VGTR as being the bottom uh, of the fraction when you work out adjusted gross margin. So the, the bottom line, bottom row of this, this slide shows adjusted gross margin for FY20, 41.8. Uh, compared to 44.8 in the prior year. Now, the points to make about the FY20 adjusted gross margin, the underlying rate was 43.2% if you adjust for snake pass and the holiday accrual. And there's a further one percentage point impact through the ownership of, of Pipeworks, which has the lower gross margin. So overall, the, the gross margin is very similar um, between FY20 and FY19. Going forward, bearing in mind the, the, the various moving parts within the business in terms of royalties, uh, which will tend to push margin up, and Pipeworks, which will tend to push margin down, uh, I would expect the underlying adjusted gross margin to be around 40%. What I am committed to do is to be transparent and, and, and show the, 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 the forces that impact on, on whatever that percentage will prove to be for, for FY20. Going over the page to adjusted EBITDA, um, this is a slide that I've relegated to the appendices in the past. I am actually quite keen to reduce the number of adjustments that we make to calculate EBITDA. I'm somewhat thwarted in my attempts to do that by a number of factors. So I've put this in the body of our presentation this time, and this shows how the adjusted EBITDA of 16.5 million is calculated. So statutory operating profit on the face of the profit and loss account, 1.3 million. We add amortization, 2.1 million. The very large majority of that relates to the acquisition of Pipeworks. So uh, the, having acquired a business, which is great, but has very little in the way of physical assets, we, we have a very large goodwill and intangible figure. We amortize the customer contracts and customer relationships, respectively over the life of the contract and over five years. And that generates a non-cash charge of 1.7 million in the 10 weeks in 2020 that we owned Pipeworks. The comparable figures for 2021 and 2022 are going to be four and a half and four million respectively. So large figures, but uh, non-cash and entirely related to the acquisition. Depreciation, three and a half million, quite a significant part of that, 1.4 million is the IFRS 16 charge on the right of use asset. Share-based payments, another non-cash charge, five million pounds for the year. That reflects the, the final landing position for the 2018 to 2020 LTIP, which was put in place just after the IPO and which matured last Wednesday. Investment and co-funded games expensed, small figure. This is actually where this item is going to move from being an expense uh, to being a net revenue. This is where we invest part of the funding towards a larger game. And we treat the investment as being uh, the creation of an asset on a nominal basis. Operating lease costs under IFR 16, that's the right of use asset, 1.5 million uh, deduction. Uh, that's in lieu of rent under stat accounts, that's included as below the line, and we're treating it as an adjustment to come out of EBITDA. This was an adjustment I was keen to, to get rid of, 
uh, but the analyst community wanted to have adjusted EBITDA before IFRS 16 cost. Foreign currency derivative contract, again, a non-cash item. We have open, uh, we have outstanding uh, hedge uh, contracts in place, which uh, cover future uh, contracted US dollar denominated revenues. And uh, this is the unrealized gain on those instruments. Uh, so there is a match between future revenue and these contracts. And this is the, the portion which has not yet been recognized through our books. Exceptional items for just over 4 million, on, uh, which are transaction fees, mainly on the acquisition of Pipeworks. The last item on this list, fair value loss on contingent consideration, is a fairly esoteric uh, and again, non-cash item. We're required to make an estimate of the consideration that may be payable on Pipeworks based on the future performance of Sumo share price and the exchange rate. This actually represents the movement between the 16th of October and the 31st of December, which results from the increase in Sumo's share price uh, and the movement in the foreign exchange rate between sterling and the US dollar. At the end of all of that, we have adjusted EBITDA of 16 and a half million um, and uh, a, a, an EBITDA margin of just under 24%. Uh, and one comment I'd make about 2021, once again, we're expecting a second half waiting as we had in 2020 and indeed before. If I go to the cash flow statement, most of this is pretty self-explanatory. The top half is relatively straightforward. A small outflow in working capital, trade and other receivables, uh, net of trade and other payables. Going forward, we would expect uh, there to be a, a, a small outflow each year. Uh, of the two years on this 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 slide, uh, 2019 was the unusual one, and 2020 is more typical. Going down to the bottom half of this capex, four and a half million, we guided the city to about five to five and a half million uh, for 2020, which is broadly split half and half between IT hardware and spending on uh, our, our studios, fixtures and fittings. A little bit of timing difference there and some of that has slipped into 2021. We are expecting a significantly higher amount in 2021, including spending about two and a half million pounds on the Pipework Studio in Eugene, which we anticipated when we signed up to buy that business, and we need to spend that money on that studio. Acquisitions, that's the cash impact of Lab42 and Pipeworks, uh, the, the consideration. Uh, placing from uh, proceeds from the issue of shares was the placing that we did in July. Borrowings, we actually drew down 10 million pounds a year ago, almost exactly, when the pandemic was just really kicking off. It was purely precautionary. We weren't sure how the banking market would react to the pandemic. We drew down 10 million, I think it was March, possibly April, and then we repaid it in June. Uh, the net borrowing figure of 4.2 million, uh, is a drawdown we have in place in the US, in US dollars, which is a hedge against the balance sheet of Pipeworks. We do have net cash as we speak. Working capital, relatively little to say on this, this slide. Um, the, the net working capital is, is down uh, from where it was in June by a small amount. The key point I'd make here is everything on this slide is in good order. We have very little in the way of overdue receivables. We are pretty prompt to invoice um, and working capital is in good shape. Consolidated balance sheets, uh, relatively little to say on this. Uh, really, uh, it reflects obviously the cash flows that we've talked about before. Uh, significant increase in goodwill and intangibles uh, following the acquisition of Pipeworks. Um, Otherwise, the borrowings, four million pounds, uh, 5.5 million US dollars, I've, I've already referred to. And the contingent consideration is the bookkeeping um, entry for the deferred consideration on Pipeworks. And going over to my, my last slide, client and project concentration. We always talk about this. It's a very apparent feature of our business. We have a small number of large projects. Um, and you know, Carl's mentioned that we can have a team of, of 200 people on any particular game. Uh, when you've got a thousand people, uh, you clearly ha can't have lots of projects reaching their peak at the same time. So in, in 2020, our top three clients were, were different to each of the previous three years, and the order was different. We were doing 11 projects for those top three, 
and that represented just under half of our revenue. There were only two individual clients who each represented more than 10% of our revenue. Carl's already mentioned that we've got more than 40 projects with 28 clients underway at the moment, up from 21 projects with 12 clients. And you just see that the business is larger and doing a broader range of work as time passes. With that, I will pass back to, to, to Carl to talk about uh, the individual projects. Thanks, David. Um, so in terms of the, the live projects we have, uh, I always <laughs> I find this slide fascinating and frustrating in equal measure, depending on the timing. I can only talk about six live projects on this slide. We'd like to talk about more, but we are constrained by commercial confidentiality. But what I, I particularly like about the slide is it just demonstrates how busy all of our studios are with multiple projects, some very, very attractive, scalable projects in terms of AAA franchises, new IP, various co-developments, etc. Sumo Digital itself for last year represented 87% of the group's revenue, so by far the busiest operating division. As I've already mentioned, we signed 49 contracts with 34 of those being in the second half. So a particularly busy year, not only in, in game development, also business development and, and commercial activity. And you know, in, term, in terms of the growth going forward, you know, the constraint is, is talent. And, and clearly, you know, all of our studios are, are focused on bringing in more talent going forward. Moving on to part two of this slide and looking at the other operating divisions we have. The Pipeworks, first of all, which is the business in the US which we acquired in October last year. The revenues that we've reported represent around 9% of the overall group's revenue, which is for the 10 weeks that uh, we had the business post acquisition. It's got a great client list. It also has some own IP with Prominence Poker. I will stress that Prominence Poker is not a real gambling game. It is only a simulation gambling game. So we, you know, we're not, you're not exchanging cash or subject to any gambling laws. But it's been great to see how the business has settled in. It's great to see them deliver their first game for Facebook in Rival Peak. They've also been working with Magic the Gathering Bell Slingers, which is for Wizards of the Coast, a very highly recognized game IP. And they've also got equally a number of, of other very exciting projects in development, which we can't share information for right now. Atom Hawk, uh, the concept art business, which we acquired back in 2017, that represents about 4% of the group's revenues, but, but really you know, provide a huge amount of synergy as well. Both Sumo Digital and Pipeworks work with Atom Hawk with, on concept art, especially around the initiation of projects. Atom Hawk themselves had an extremely busy year working on more than 50 small scale projects. Um, they lit their well placed for growth in, in 21 and it's great to see how they've been, been engaging with all their partners with, with a couple of, of titles there which I'm sure you're aware of such as Call of Duty and, and Minecraft if not all the rest. I think the great thing is all of our studios are busy um, you know, and Clearly, the constraint that we have is, is around talent acquisition, where we, we plan to grow heads by roughly 200 to 250 people in the year, depending on the blend of, of some contracting that we achieve. And I'll come on to that on the next slide. But then finally, just a little bit more about secret mode. We're essentially here, we're grasping the publishing opportunity we have for our own catalogue of IP that I mentioned earlier but also looking at other indie developed games which we can possibly help to bring to market. We've got a highly experienced team that we brought into Run Secret Mode and they're very engaged with the indie community and, and evaluating opportunities at the moment. Just moving on to the slide on our people and talent acquisition it is clearly something which is more challenging during a pandemic. We did see a slowdown in applicants in the initial lockdown in the early part of 20. We still managed to grow our overall headcount, including acquisitions by 36% and roughly 15% of that was organic. So a, a great achievement. And, and I think that combined with the reflection in our best company survey result shows we were able to onboard people very comfortably uh, and, and integrate them into the culture of the business. We certainly don't 
plan on slowing down uh, our uh, headcount uh, uh, attraction and and we're working in as many innovative ways as we can to attract new talent to to, to sumo but but ultimately what really attracts talent is apart from having a you know a, a competitive remuneration base it is the great projects we're working on and i talked about lots of projects that we can't share information on on slide uh, 19. We do share a lot of that information with, with candidates when they come and they're under NDA and the projects we're working on is attracting talent. So we're very optimistic about being able to achieve our headcount growth this year. Also very pleased to report that our attrition rates ran at normal levels, um, you know, very competitive rates in, in single digits, particularly in India, which is probably the lowest attrition rate that, that we've seen since we started the business back in 2007. Utilisation, David touched on. We, our utilisation generally runs at around 93, 94% for the group. Last year it ran at 92.6. We normally target India to run at 80%. It ran at 79.3. Prior year it did run in excess of 90. And that is around timing of projects. And, and we keep some flexibility in India with it being a lower cost geography. We also continue to explore the use of contractors. We've used a significant amount of contractors in the past. In 2020, roughly 6% of our overall uh, staff months came from external contractors. We're forecasting around 9% for 21, and we are going to see if that's a lever we can pull further to increase the amount of work that we can do. Just briefly on ESG, which is a topic uh, which seems to be getting more focus. You know, it is a key area of focus for us. We started to mention this a year ago at our uh, 2019 full year results. We are going to be reporting a, a, on a streamlined energy and, and carbon report in our, in our annual report and accounts this year. We are making other inroads into various aspects of our business, predominantly around our people and ensuring we have a great level of engagement. We've also started the Sumo Digital Academy, which is looking at talent acquisition and bringing people in to reskill from different industries and getting them in, into the video game industry where they may have overlooked that the first time around. And we're also well progressed to, to achieving ISO 27001 uh, accreditation for IT security purposes. And just briefly on the market, the new console launches from Sony and Microsoft went extremely well. In fact, I think demand is still outstripping supply there. And you've done very well if you've been able to get hold of a, a PlayStation 5 or an Xbox. Um, what I particularly like about this slide is just the demonstration that we've got six of the world's largest tech businesses all actively looking for content in our industry. You know, we are in a very supportive market the demand is as high as it's ever been and, and i think that's you know, driven by several different factors but but predominantly the the transition to digital where people can download a game without having to go to the shop to, to get physical media it, it's been a massive boost the fact that we're more connected than we've ever been and most games you do play online now and you you you, you form friendships and, and, and partnerships with people you play online that you probably never meet in real life, which leads to a level of, of engagement you don't see in passive entertainment. And, and as Sumo as a group, we, we, you know, we remain really well placed to, to benefit from the increase in demand. At the end of the day, we're, we're a sub 100 million turnover business in a, in a market worth over 175 billion. So uh, there's plenty of room for us to maintain our momentum. And then just moving on to, to our final slide on strategy. Uh, we've made acquisitions. We'll continue to make more acquisitions. We've got a strong pipeline, but we are going to remain disciplined in what we acquire and the rationale behind those acquisitions. We've added new clients um, significantly in, in the last 12 months uh, and improved client concentration. And we will continue to, to improve that naturally as we get larger. We're developing our own IP. Um, and we'll continue to develop uh, more of our own IP as, as we go forwards. We've established our own video game publisher in secret mode, uh, and we're excited by the opportunities which we believe they can bring by having a, a dedicated team to help deliver new opportunities. And we started 21 in a great place. 
uh, and we're excited by what the year holds for us and, and, and beyond this year. Uh, global demand for premium quality content is at an all-time high for Sumo, uh, and we believe we're in great shape to benefit from opportunities that the market can present. And, and that concludes my presentation. So what I'd like to do now is hand it over to uh, Q&A. We have a question for David. Can you expand on the costs relating to own IP royalties? Are they significant? And what's the gross margin of the own IP royalties? Okay, thank you. I'm um, very happy to do that. So there, there are two principal types of costs that are associated with own IP royalties. Uh, one is the uh, the item I referred to when I was talking about uh, adjusted EBITDA. So where we co-fund a game, um, so let's say a hypothetical game maybe costs £10 million, publisher pays £9 million, uh, we contribute one million of, of 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 cost to that game to to get a ten percent share. The um, uh, the amount it costs us to put that one million in would be of the region of half a million by the time you've you've dealt with the margin on that. Um, and so what we do now is we we have to or we choose to uh, identify the costs that we've already incurred against the revenues that we then generate. So so basically the release of that. Um, booked cost against the royalty we generate uh, is is the main cost. Uh, there are also cases where, uh, with games that we get royalties on, we incur marketing costs promoting the sale of that game. Um, the, those figures tend tend to be rather smaller. Uh, the the margin on uh, royalties uh, for in the year was about fifty percent. So you can see there's a significant amount of cost going against those um, that, that, that royalty revenue. Great, thank you. And what's the reason for the half two waiting in each year that you refer to? The main reason is um, we, we end the year with significantly more people than we start the year. And most of our revenue is in the form of development fees and development fees are related to headcount. So we, we have more capacity in the second half of the year than we have in the first half of the year. Um, it does tend to be accentuated uh, by other factors around timing of, of royalties and timing of contracts being signed. So there is an inherent tendency for the second half to be uh, larger than the first half. And that's true in Sumo Digital, uh, to a lesser extent, Atom Hawk, and certainly again in, in Pipeworks. Thank you. And have you seen any tightness in your labour market translating into wage price inflation? We've, we've always had significant wage inflation. Um, and what, bear in mind, we, we generally operate with fixed price contracts, which are multi-year. Uh, when, we, when we set the contract price at the outset, we factor into our costing significant increases in employment costs uh, over the life of that project. Um, the good thing is most of our clients have their own uh, development capacity, as Carl's mentioned, and they uh, they are seeing similar inflation profiles. So we have we've uh, almost invariably been successful at inflation proofing our project contracts, um, and you know, we are keen to pay people well. We're keen to 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 do that to re to recruit and retain, um, and we've been able to do that without impacting on margin. Thank you. Are transaction fees really exceptional, given that acquisitions happen every year? Interesting question. Um, they're certainly not trading, and, and I guess whether exceptional is the right word to use, they're certainly separately identifiable. And uh, what I wouldn't want to do is to get to a point where we were discouraged from pursuing um, transactions for a fear of impacting on our underlying profit. And clearly, it's not an impact on underlying profit. So, uh, exceptional may be debatable, but that's the wording that, that's generally used and accepted. Thank you. And um, what should we expect for share-based payments going forward? So, in the um, presentation deck, which is on our website, uh, I always put in the uh, future year's uh, expectations for share-based payments. Uh, the only proviso on that is I can only do that for schemes that are currently in place. So um, if someone wanted to look at page 30, uh, slide 33 of our deck, 
you would see that I've set out forecasts for 21, 22 and 23, uh, broadly two and a half million in 21, dropping down to just under a million in 22. Now I would um, anticipate that we will make more rewards year by year, so the figures will increase, but I would expect the number to be around two and a half, possibly three million a year. It does depend a little on uh, outside factors, including the share price performance. Um, and there is a sort of paradox that the stronger the share price performance, the, the, the higher the, the, the share based payment charge. Thank you. And what do you see the growth of the industry being for the next couple of years after such a strong year? So I, I should probably take that one. The, the industry was already forecast to grow a, a CAGR of roughly 10% anyway. So it was already growing considerably. That The pandemic has inevitably caused a number of players to re-engage with playing games in the market and, and also bring in new players. For Sumo, we don't see a direct impact of that because we don't do direct to consumer at the moment. We will do eventually with secret mode. But most of our business is business to business. But what it has done with us is give a confidence, I guess, to our client base, which is why we're seeing such a large business development pipeline um, of, of opportunities. But with our contracted revenue basis, you know, we already have a great deal of, of, of predictability in what we're going to do for this year and next year and beyond. So we're slightly insulated from both the, the potential improvement of the market due to the, uh, the pandemic and also the possible attrition where players may stop playing. But, but I think even if that some of them did stop playing, we're probably still going to see an excess of the original forecast 10% even prior to the, uh, the uh, pandemic. Thank you. And the final stated pass the punch was launched in December 2020. Um, this person has tried to obtain a copy, but they're unable to see it listed. Can you detail which platforms it's available for and how I can purchase? It's on mobile platforms and it's in soft launch at the moment in, uh, in other territories. It will be coming to this territory soon. We're, we're, we're refining things through soft launches. Thank you. And um, can you talk a little about Hood Outlaws and Legends in terms of expectations for the game? And how do the game economics work with Focus Home Interactive? Um, I'm, I'm not at liberty to talk about the, the economics because that's a, a confidential commercial agreement between us and Focus. Um, but we did conceive that whole game. It is our original game idea. Um, we, we have a, a joint ownership in how that is brought to market focus on the name hood we own the actual game assets all the game all the underlying technology so it really is a a, a a partnership in bringing the game to market we are extremely excited by the potential of the game um, the, the team have put in a huge amount of effort in to to refining the game and the reception that it's received from its original announcement last uh, August to date has, has been exceptionally strong. So, you know, we, uh, we remain cautiously optimistic about the, the commercial opportunity of the game when it's released in May. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I love the game. It, it's, uh, it's a great concept and it's great to see one of our original ideas being brought to, uh, brought to the market. Thank you. And what do you see as the limiting factors for future growth? The main limiting factor for us is, is talent acquisition. Um, talent is the big, it, it's the single um, competing interest we have with our peers on market and, and, and private businesses in the video game space. Uh, the, the talent for the, for the industry is a recognised problem and it's something we're, we're, we're trying to solve as an industry wide initiative um, we, we do need to make sure we attract more people to to choosing games as a career and and it's seen as a viable career going forward uh, but one of the reasons we've now got 13 studios across five countries is to ensure that we are searching in different talent pools and we're attracting from different talent pools worldwide so we remain optimistic about our chances to be able to achieve 
the required headcount growth through talent acquisition. Thank you. So what advice would you give to a teenager keen to join the industry? They're a keen gamer, currently studying computer science A-level and a sumo shareholder. <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a really good question. Get yourself along to the various, when, when we can again, get yourself along to the various shows and industry events that happen in the UK or wherever you may be based. Um, start mixing with the industry. There's a huge amount of information available online through Tiger and Yuki, the two main industry bodies in the UK. Lots of, of video game developers, and particularly us at Sumo, we, we spend a lot of time going around to different schools and universities and giving talks. Um, pick the, the career path you want and, and select the best university. Without doubt, the UK has some of the best university courses worldwide for, for getting yourself ready for a career in, in the video game industry. Thank you. And in the House Brokers note following finals, revenue forecasts were raised by 10.2 million, but there was no corresponding increase in adjusted EBITDA, despite perhaps suggesting Sumo is under no additional margin pressure. Could you provide further colour to explain these changes? Sure, there are probably a couple of main factors. I think the, the figures when we did the pipe works deal, we we'll probably pitched a little low. So there's an element of correction there. There's also the the fact that we're putting in uh, revenue for uh, secret mode, uh, which is is expected to be making a small loss this year. So that those are the two main factors. Uh, I'm happy with the the the, the market uh, consensus as it is now. Um, so I th yeah, those are the two main reasons for that adjustment. Thank you. And we've got a question from Ben Miller. Just wanted to understand in terms of future acquisitions, how are they likely to be funded? Is that likely to be shareholder dilution or, or other means? Thank you. So um, it's interesting that the businesses we look at acquiring tend to be young, fast growing businesses, often owner managed. And so we, we're always balancing the form of consideration and the timing of consideration. So it's highly likely that we would be paying a mixture of equity and cash, and we'd be paying a mixture of upfront and contingent uh, deferred consideration. So um, it, it, it's going to be a mixture on both, both factors in terms of form and, and, and timing. Uh, we are very keen to use equity uh, because it aligns interest with, with the owner manager, um, and it, it also helps the, the potentially helps the liquidity in our trading volumes, which are relatively low. We are keen to improve those, but we're also mindful of the fact that equity is the most expensive form of consideration, and so uh, it's not something we you know, we don't issue shares lightly. Uh, so it has to be a case by case basis. The impression we get from talking to our our, our institutional shareholders in particular is that they are supportive of the right deal at the right price. So we, we regard ourselves as having the capacity to, to make acquisitions. Um, and, and it really depends on, as I say, on a case by case basis. There are smaller deals um, if we were buying, I mean, Lab 42 being an example, which we acquired from a, from a trade uh, seller, um, we just paid in cash and that was very straightforward, but it was a very small deal. Uh, so it really depends on what's right for the particular circumstance. Thank you very much. And that's the end of questions. Carl, do you have any closing remarks? Um, just to add that, you know, with, with demand being as, as strong as it, it as we've ever seen it, you know, we remain very positive uh, about the year ahead and the, and the future of Sumo and Sumo Group.